Hello and a warm welcome to this, the last edition of Connor Day Unplugged in 2020. It's Tuesday the 22nd December, so I suppose I should really have some Christmas music on in the background. Anyway, just three days before Christmas, so I hope you've all done your festive shopping. I'm Jeremy Hawkins here in London, and appropriately enough in the wake of the latest tightening of COVID-19 restrictions, I'm by myself on today's podcast. So with December the 31st almost within touching distance, I thought to have a short look at some of the takeaways from what's been a truly remarkable year for financial markets, the economy and indeed humanity itself. So where are we then? Well, we're clearly not remotely close to where the forecasting community thought we'd be this time last year. Amongst the major central banks, the Fed was calling for 2% GDP growth in the US in 2020, the ECB for 1.1% in the Eurozone, and the Bank of England for about 1.5% in the UK. In the real world of 2020, it's actually just a question of how big the contraction in each region is going to be. And a quick answer to that is huge. At the outset, the fundamental problem with forecasting is inevitably that we simply don't know what's going to happen in the future. If we did, it wouldn't be a forecast, it would be a known. And even when a seemingly highly plausible projection comes up against the tail risk the size of the coronavirus, well, it's a bit like a rowing boat running into a cruise liner. There's only ever going to be one winner. And for that matter, in terms of calling the economy correctly, it didn't help that we weren't much better at forecasting the virus either. That was supposed to have been taken care of months ago. Which begs the question, are forecasts a complete waste of time? Well, if they are, then central bankers have a big problem because they need to base their policies upon some kind of fundamental platform. To quote the well-known saying, monetary policy works with long and variable lags, so it's vital to have an idea of how changes in policy now will impact economic developments further down the road. Sensibly, because of all the added uncertainty caused by the virus this year, many central banks have switched from emphasising a central case scenario to offering a range of forecasts. In some cases, they become more simulations or what-ifs rather than outright projections, and perhaps we'll see more of that approach in the future. The Fed has already indicated its long-term economic projections will have less impact on policy decisions going forward. What else have we learnt? Well, trillions of liquidity sloshing around the world's financial markets, courtesy of unprecedented central bank quantitative easing, or QE, had to find a home somewhere. And with interest rates pretty well everywhere at rock bottom, that's allowed equity markets to largely decouple from a global economy experiencing its worst recession since the Great Depression. Yes, we've seen the major indices suffering setbacks at various times, but They've tended to be only relatively mild and short lived, despite the ongoing hit from COVID-19, which goes to show that when it comes to liquidity, size really does matter. The virus has also shown us that traditional working practices can be upended remarkably quickly. And it may be that much of what has become a sizable shift from working at the office to working from home is here to stay. And linked to this potential structural change, COVID-19 has even shown us that asset class designations are not necessarily a given. Hence, tech stocks, particularly those of internet platform-based companies that typically regarded as risky assets, suddenly became a form of safe haven investments as rising virus cases saw time spent at home, working or otherwise, increase substantially, and with it, the demand for technology products. Perhaps defining which asset goes into which asset class now requires a much broader consideration of what's happening in the real world. 2020 has also reaffirmed what we already knew central banks are not very good at meeting inflation targets. In fact, they've struggled so much that pure inflation targeting could become a thing of the past. The Fed has multiple objectives and after its ongoing structural policy review, the ECB might move in a similar direction before very long. The likes of the Bank of England and the Reserve Bank of Australia both have pure inflation targets, but now see more focus on unemployment rates than prices. This year has similarly underlined central banks' preference for the often substantial wiggle room for policy accommodated by qualitative as opposed to quantitative forward guidance. So the Fed will keep buying at least $120 billion of debt a month until substantial further progress has been made in the recovery, whatever that means, while ECB interest rates aren't going up until the inflation output robustly converges to a level sufficiently close to but below 2% within its projection. 
protection horizon sufficiently being the key and suitably vague word here. So no risk there of being tied to a policy change when perhaps other economic indicators argue against a move. On the fiscal side of things, we also know now that when push comes to shove, budget deficits don't really matter. Emergency COVID rescue plans have seen deficit to GDP and debt to GDP ratios reach levels this year that not so long, very long ago would have given the IMF a heart attack. Yet now the same institution is emphasising the need to avoid a premature withdrawal of fiscal stimulus. Modern monetary theory, which essentially means that any government spending can be paid for by money creation, seems to have won some new support. Meantime, QE has revealed that the link between money supply and inflation remains tenuous. At the start of this year, annual US M2 growth was running at about 6.5%. It's now expanding at around 25%. And yet, core PCE inflation was still only 1.4% in October. Similarly, in the Eurozone, M3 growth was 3.9% in January and 10.5% in inflation. But core inflation over the same period, well, it fell from 1.3% to its current record equaling low of just 0.2%. Yes, inflation expectations may have risen, but really only very slightly and certainly don't suggest that prices are about to accelerate significantly anytime soon. By and large, the surge in money growth seems to have been ignored. In the foreign exchange markets, the dollar at times has shown signs of still being investors' go-to currency during moments of crisis, but ultimately it's been Fed rate cuts and massive QE that have been more important. Shifts in US monetary policy still take priority over equivalent moves elsewhere. And with the Fed's balance sheet expanding more quickly than those of the ECB, the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan, it should be no surprise, I guess, that the greenback has lost ground in 2020. We're back again to the effects of all that liquidity sloshing around in search of a home. In Asia, the regional safe haven currency remains the yen and in Europe, the Swiss franc. Meantime, if you want volatility, you still can't do much better than the cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin got trashed during the first virus wave in March, falling around 50% against the dollar, but has since appreciated more than 400% to new record highs. So to end on a high note, we've also learned never to underestimate the power of science. To create and begin delivering inside 10 months a brand new vaccine that not very long ago it would have taken many years to produce is quite remarkable. It's also a reminder of what can be achieved when some countries work with rather than against each other. So that's it for me then for this year. The podcast will be back in the first week of January with a full crew and a look at what the big issues are likely to be in 2021. Thanks so much for taking the time to listen during 2020. And on behalf of the entire Econa Day team, I'd like to wish everyone a very happy Christmas and a much, much better 2021. There will still be market moving indicators and events to watch out for over the holiday period. But as I'm sure you already know, you can keep up to date with all of those via Econa Day's global economic calendar. According to the folks at The Economist magazine, the COVID-19 pandemic has dominated news coverage more than any other topic since the Second World War. Here's hoping that it won't be doing the same next year. We'll see you then. Bye for now.